Uh, right, hello uh, everybody. Welcome to today's podcast. This is Adrian Boothy here. It's the 30th of March 2020 uh, and this is the Trend Signal Trading Podcast. And what we're talking about today, uh, well a relative bounce in the markets and as we call the title, even dead cats bounce on a two trillion dollar stimulus package. It'd be hard not to have a bounce off something like that, you would think, but then these are uncertain times. So uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague and Chief Market Analyst at Trend Signal, Jerry Miller. Hello, Jerry. Hello there. Hi. Hi. How 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 are we doing, Jerry? All uh, all safe, You're corona not... free. Yep, cough free, corona free. That's good. We had a, a small scare last week with uh, my middle child was forty point three degrees, um, but he actually got through it after about oh, twelve about twelve hours. So he was he was all right. We're, we're back okay. Again. Not without a bit. Not without a bit of angst. Yeah. No, there was definitely uh, de definitely a decent share of that, that's for sure. But uh, and what about the markets? Plenty of angst in the markets, or are we feeling a little bit better about them? Uh, well, the market feels better about itself, that's for sure. But uh, in terms of the prospects, it's still uncertain. And and this is the problem with these markets. People sort of say, well, well, now it's going to do this because this news has come out. And now this news has come out, it's going to do this. No one really knows. We've not dealt with a pandemic of this proportion. We've suffered from Hong Kong flu back in the 60s. We've had MERS and SARS, but they weren't pandemics. Nothing like what's going on here. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of question marks over what's happening, but a lot of it is we can articulate our views on it and, 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 and tell everyone what we think, what it means and how it may affect the markets, but nothing. It, it, it's far from certain. That's, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Well, one thing that is certain is what's already happened. So why don't we have a look at um, uh, the markets over the last few uh, days? Well, last week, a uh, bit of a bounce on the equity markets and a bit of a bounce on the euro and the and the pound, wasn't there, Jerry? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, what it, it's you, you know you might refer to this as risk on, but that that would be incorrect. It is a version of risk on, but I would call it a risk correction. So what I mean by risk correction is that markets may have overdone it on the downside perhaps the previous week uh, and yeah. so last week I think there was a bit of a re-evaluation of things some of the sectors uh, were reappraised uh, some of the hospitality and travel sector certainly in the US got absolutely whacked uh, some stocks up to 80% uh, in terms of uh, value lost so uh, a bit of value buying or I think we might call it bottom fishing um, but anyway, I mean, it helped the market. Doesn't it? An eighty percent fall sounds staggering. You think, how on earth is that going to happen? But you know, let's let's face facts that there are going to be some companies that are going to go bust. They're not going to bail everyone out, yeah, are they? Yeah. Or are they? Yeah, so, when you go bust, you lose hundred percent. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, eighty percent absolutely are paid out last. Let's face it. Well, yeah, shareholders. If a company goes bust, then there's no um, uh, value in the business anymore. Not to the shareholders. Uh, it's left to. Uh, there'll be a lot of Chapter 11s flying around, but of course. Um, the government in the governments in the US, in Europe, and in the UK are doing all they can now. So this is different to the great financial crisis age, and where it really was down to central banks to get that oil into the machine uh, and and make sure that the machine didn't um, seize up. This is where the actual machine, as we said last week, is just falling apart. Uh, and the important thing is that our governments have to pr protect and preserve businesses so that when this is over people can get back to work but if airlines have gone bust in pounds uh, planes have been impounded bank covenants have been breached and people have been sacked and have gone off and it, it becomes very difficult so this is the real problem that governments are faced with as for the markets last week they did bounce uh, a significant bounce uh, the european mm -hmm. markets less so uh, and the reason being is that they didn't have they had a worse week the previous week, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. so in a way, they had less. Uh, um, sorry, the, the, the U.S. Had markets had the worst week the previous week. They had recovered a little bit the previous week. So, in essence, and I think the uh, stimulus the was slightly ahead in the in Europe than uh, the U.S. as well, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'd done. We certainly we cut rates pretty quickly here in the U.K. We'd had the budget, then we'd had an emergency. Uh, sort of announcement by Rishi Sunak to help businesses and then you had the further one to help self-employed people so yeah there's a lot of the timeline sort of stretches back a little bit further with us but the Dow 2,462 points it rallied last week Adrian and that by the way yeah. was after I don't know whether you watched the market on Friday night in the last did, half yeah. 700 points just like yeah. a knife through butter 
that yeah, tells you. Unreal. It, it was a phenomenal yeah. dynamic trader trade with that strategy there. I mean, I, I could I could probably bring the chart up now, but it was it was textbook. I mean, as as was the long just before then. I mean, you're often getting this into the close, these sort of big moves into the close. And of course, in the weekend, people are just going to take a bit of risk off into the weekend, aren't they? Because who knows what's going to yeah. happen over the weekend? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, no, that's exactly that's exactly what happens. I mean, it was almost surprising to be as high as it was coming into uh, the, the, the very end of the day. But, um, yeah, it's yeah, staggering. Well, um, if, if you poured your gin and tonic early on Friday evening, you might have been a bit uh, misty eyed on Saturday morning and looked at your screen and thought, what the hell? <laughs> It's, it's funny because I, I remember, you know, some of the moves that um, were taking place on the two-minute charts, you know, as we sort of get into the very early part of March and there was, you know, one or two sort of five, six, seven hundred point winners on the Dow. Um, and you just think, my God, you know, and all of a sudden you have this big, but they're happening all the time now. It's just, it's, yeah, they do. It's they are. They are. But of course, stops and, are wide and, and, you know, and you know. Yeah. But, but, but it is important to understand that the reason why this is happening is not because someone sort of flicked a switch. It's because there is so much uncertainty and the market is driven sharply in one direction, like it was last week, you know, two and a half thousand points nearly on the Dow. And that's after it fell those 700 points in the evening on Friday. So otherwise it would have been 3,100 points. That would have been near sort of 15%. Um, yeah. Needless to say, it was probably the best three day winning streak for decades, really. Um, and as you've pointed out, that was a reaction to the $2 trillion uh, stimulus or rescue deal, whatever you want to call it, that was agreed by Congress. And then Trump uh, finally signed it off into law uh, on Friday. So uh, it, it's that. Uh, I think there's, gosh, people saying, oh, we've got a bottom put in. Now, do you think that's it on the downside? Again, I, 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 it would be a, I'd be very foolish to start uh, saying that's the case. Um, there's a lot more news to come out. Time will tell, won't it? All we can do is take one move yeah, at a time, yeah. which is just a bit, you know, yeah, yeah. sort of football yeah. thing, isn't it? Game and all yeah, that sort of stuff. But just is what it is. We get too carried away with um, this move and think, oh, that's it. We're going to go straight back up to thirty thousand. Then I think people are set for a bit of a loss, aren't they? Let's face it. Well, what, 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 what's interesting, even with that rally though, Aidan. So the markets rallied what nearly thirteen percent on the Dow, ten and a half percent on the S and P. Uh, DAX and Eurostox, uh, DAX, Eurostox and FTSE, all less so last week, as, as I've said at the beginning, DAX rallied about just under 8%, the FTSE rallied just over 6% um, for reasons that we have discussed. But the, the US stocks are, t are still 25% below their peak, and they peaked, they had an all-time high on the 19th of February. Isn't that mad? Yeah, you know, 19, it seems like so long ago, it's, it's less than six weeks ago. But of course, that was 19th of February. We were making new highs whilst the China was has gone into lockdown. And we were just, yeah. I was sort of thinking, how come they've managed to sort of close the borders to this virus? I mean, surely it's got out. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's we history. had a new all time high, didn't we, on the, the 20th of February, uh, I think it was yeah. on the S&Ps. Um, yeah. And yeah, and at the time they were talking, the articles were saying, because we talked about this in the podcast, about how they were saying that. Uh, uh, they've priced in the risk of uh, the coronavirus, uh, and yet the market yeah. was at all-time highs. And, and, and like we, some questionable I, uh, pricing in. <laughs> no, but I do. I do remember we said we didn't think that the market had priced in enough risk from this. God, talk about not pricing in enough risk. <laughs> uh, obviously, yeah. a lot of stuff has changed then. Now, I mean, the US didn't have one case of coronavirus, and now it's got 120,000. Well, we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? I mean, they've um, 142,000, uh, the US, so they've jumped to the top of the uh, official stats, quite how accurate uh, these official stats are. Um, we, okay, we'll probably yeah, I'm not sure. Know. What, what, what's that date? I've got the one from the FT, and it's, yeah, it's got 142,735. Yeah. Italy with 97,000, and Spain with 85,000. I, I, gosh, it's just extraordinary. Uh, but um, I, I do know that the likes of Veneto and Lombardy, the virus was circulating there, circulating there for at least three weeks everywhere and nothing was done about it. Nothing. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to peak. I think we'll probably be up at, gosh, 100,000 before we start to turn down. Yeah. Um, because but, but, um, it, it, 
it's interesting what we were saying earlier though is that the the level of testing is very different between different countries so you look at the anomaly of germany which has got 62,000 cases but only 541 deaths which is you know less than um it's very low uh, percentage isn't it yeah and, and, so it's and, less than one percent whereas uk it's more than that, but it's like five percent, yeah. yeah. But but the reason being that we're not testing anything like as much, and so our number of infections at nineteen and a half thousand clearly understates the real picture. And and these epidemiologists have all said that it's likely that the infection rate is ten times this amount, uh, not just in the UK but in other countries. But obviously in Germany they've gone to a lot of lengths to actually test more and more people so that they know a nearer the number that they infection rate that they've got 62,000 um, and it's likely of course deaths are deaths deaths are reported because people die but yeah. um, you, you don't have the infection right rate right so it's likely that uh, if you take an, a mortality rate similar to Germany then our infection rate is um, is quite a bit higher than Germany's yeah yeah uh, okay and what about the, um, the forex markets then Jerry um, what, what have we been seeing there Oh gosh, almost as, uh, I mean, it's quite unusual to see the sort of volatility um, in the US dollar uh, that we've seen over the last three weeks. It's just an extraordinary move. Uh, first of all, the extraordinary move in the uh, dollar as it rallied and, and people are sort of wondering, well, why is the dollar rallying? Why, why, is, why is the dollar, you know, if you look at what happened in the euro, for example, you know, the euro, what did it go from um, uh, 114 or thereabouts around the 10th 11th of march yeah uh, well, and then we really hit 115 and then we went down yeah. to 106 40 uh 106 30 or so um okay. what 10 days later and now yeah, we're back okay. up somewhere I mean, in the middle yeah that's right so it's effectively what you've got to remember is the euro is a reserve currency but the dollar is the world's reserve currency uh, and in the blind panic that there was two uh, not last week but the previous week investors were selling assets as, as soon as they could to free up put it into cash they were selling sovereign bonds which normally would be safe haven assets they were selling gold but what did they put their money in dollars hence the reason why the dollar rallied now you might say well hang on a second well why is the dollar fallen sharply last week well that's because it was no one was selling last week they were buying <laughs> so it was sort of a risk correction and the same reason you got a risk correction in equities you also got this correction in the US dollar and that's what saw the dollar uh, fall from sort of 107 against the euro uh, back up to 111 where it is at the moment well I, I suspect um, there'll be a bit of backing and filling because those three last those three days last week uh, just an extraordinary move from 108 up to 111 that's proper volatility for our forex markets yeah absolutely that's something we kind of lacked um for a chunk of last year didn't we but um my yeah. word it's it's uh, it's come back yeah. so up about four percent on euro dollar last week um pound yeah. dollar up more than that i mean that was um that was even yeah well we we, we were talking uh, about this earlier on adrian it, it i think what caused the initial um collapse in sterling was the fact that the our central bank the bank of england cut rates uh, outside of a, a normal meeting from 75 basis points uh, down to 25 basis points to so the initial half point cut and that really pulled the rug from underneath sterling and you might say well, well what does that why would that weaken sterling you know it's gone from virtually nothing to less than nothing in terms of interest rate but that's still something that investors enjoy so if you've got euros where you're getting nothing and you decide and you put your money in sterling you're going to get a positive carry because you're going to earn interest on it but all of a sudden, 25 basis points, you're down to a quarter percent, and then they cut it again. So you, you see what I mean? There was no mm. there was such thing happening in, in Euroland. Um, and, and so that's the reason why sterling crumbled as much as it did. As with most things, where a pendulum in the market performs, that pendulum swung a little bit too far. Um, I think sub you know 115 was just overdoing it and the market has rebounded so uh, that's a significant rebound uh, even more so than the euro so sterling was up nearly eight cents yesterday uh up what is that sort of 6.7 percent adrian but yeah you might say wow that's amazing i've never seen a move like that well look at the move you know it fell from 131 and a half down to 115 in um one two three four five six seven eight 
eight, nine days, so less than two weeks. We just, we, it's not easy to always sort of explain it on fundamentals, but I'd say that that just got sold too heavily and too hard too quickly. And that's the reason why we're seeing that. It you know, certainly make a bit of sense. I mean, euro against other currencies um, certainly didn't fare as well as it did against the dollar, uh, whereas pound seemed to rally pretty much against everything else uh, last week. Yeah. So yeah. Um, sort of suggests that the pound was just overcooked. Uh, yeah. really. and, and if you look at the, a, a euro sterling chart, Adrian, especially, you can see where we are now is where we were on the 13th, so a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So it's 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 you could just sort of rule out that spike up to 95 and back down again. It's almost like it didn't happen, although it did for reasons we've discussed. Uh, markets are just volatile uh, and the volatility is not because someone's pushed a switch or anything. It's because there is so much uncertainty and markets are trying to sort of articulate the risk in the markets. And, and it's a it's a very much a changing situation, isn't it? I mean, it only it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, only recently, you know, the, the announcements, if you look at the papers today, uh, I think the front page of the um, Express and the Mail talks about a lockdown, this whole thing lasting for six months. Donald Trump thinks it's going to be over by the end of April. It, in fact, if it was going to be over in the middle of April. I mean, all of this is, that's just plain wrong. But it's a little bit, perhaps over tightening the screws a little bit, saying six months. But you can imagine us being in lockdown and then gradually some restrictions being eased but but if it's not if it eased too quick if things are eased too quickly the virus uh, spread will just increase again and you'll have the same pressure on the national health service people will die that shouldn't die etc cetera, etc cetera. but on, on another point fascinating to see mercedes and ucl uh collaborating on the manufacture of these breathing aids these um yeah yeah um uh, the uh, CPAP machines, these continuous positive airway pressure machines. It's interesting because we don't have enough ventilators. When someone's on a ventilator, they've got to be sedated because the tube goes down their, you know, esophagus or whatever it is, or into the, you know, to make sure they get air into their lungs. Whereas this is something that you you can wear and carry on whilst lying in bed. Uh, and also they're very cheap to manufacture. And it's just amazing that along with university, as it, you know, the uh, University College London, I think UCL, uh, and their um, engineers, they managed to come up with something that is going to deliver oxygen to the lungs without the need for a ventilator. So it will cut down the use of ventilators by 50%. You know, that's just got to be good, hasn't it? It's got to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what do we think about the markets for the, for the week ahead? I mean, I, I know last week was a, a bumper week for us for our end of day uh, swing traders. We're up... Uh, for March, you know, well over 2,000 points for the month now. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I guess it's just sitting, sitting and waiting for the next turns, really, isn't it? I, I suppose. Um, yeah. I, I mean, we can only trade um, what we what what we see in front of us, Adrian, can't we? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, and th 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 there's been some amazing moves, actually. I mean, you look at the likes of Euro Sterling, the sell trade there. I mean, I was talking about this to to people that you know the market was running up, and I was talking about some of these moves that are going to come back the other way, are going to be interesting. This might be short lived, and maybe we'll move back in line with the longer term direction. But for now, uh, the markets are putting in some some fantastic trading opportunities. So we see Euro Sterling, we see Pound Dollar. Um, we see a lot of the pound moves last week. We were along quite a few, weren't we? So the likes of pound yeah. against the Canadian dollar, um, fantastic buy after 170.99, and there it is, some 400 points higher. Um, similar picture on a lot of markets, wasn't it, Jerry? A lot of reversals yeah. kind of everywhere, and that's because there's quite a big level of correlation across the board, isn't there? Right? Yeah, and, and 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 of course it's an appreciation of the quite an expansion in volatility. But whilst un if you understand that, then it's it's a lot easier to trade. You are never going to buy the bottom of any market. That never happens because if you do, you're speculating on a, on it being the bottom. I mean, what do we it's do on cable? Though, isn't it? Yeah, what do we do on cable? I mean, we ended up buying cable at sort of one eighteen seventy odd, having seen it back down at one stage. It was down at close to one fourteen. But yeah. the reason why it's safer to buy it at 118 than 114, sure, you made a lot more money if you bought it at 114, but a lot of people could have been buying it at 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, all the way down. But the market's yeah. only reversed when it's confirmed that. And that's the reason why uh, it, 
you know, it, it has an, you have to appreciate that to make to, to feel confident about it. Yeah. That's what trend signal does. I, I think the problem at the moment with the, the the size of the moves is that low and high are such relative terms, aren't they? I mean, you look at sterling dollar. That's, um, you know, that's on the right hand side of the chart there, one twenty eight. That's low compared to where it was. Yeah. That's even lower. Does that make that mm -hmm. good value to buy? Well, relative to two days ago, very good value, but actually the, the, it's a changing thing, isn't it? So again, that's even lower, that's even lower, that's even lower. So you don't know it's going up until it's after it started to go up. And if all you're gonna do is try and buy a market just because it's cheap, then you're gonna have some big problems. And yeah. uh, as some people probably were buying your uh, pound dollar at 125, um and god knows whether they were still still long at this point probably not well they're, they're, they're probably the people who are selling it down at 114 and you know that's that's what happens isn't it they get yeah, forced yeah. yeah. you know, it'll never go down there and, and of course it does no so that's one of the things we have to be careful of and and very much waiting until these signals are confirmed uh, and that's when we take those trades there's uh, the, the the expression is cheap and expensive but just relative terms and when someone sort of says to me where do you think you could go? My aunt, honestly, my genuine answer is I don't really know. We've got targets on our charts, of course. That's one thing. But in a longer term, how can you value the value of sterling against the dollar um, in the long run now? I mean, central banks, are not central banks, investment banks tried to do it at the beginning of the year. They all mm. said the dollar was going to weaken this year. Well, completely yeah. wrong. And you actually, well, of course, they're wrong because of what's happened with COVID-19. But they were wrong even before. But that's before. the point. But that's the point is there's always going to be something that's going to change it you can't really take a view um that that long can you so for us all we do is look at one sort of turn at a time uh really, yeah. isn't it? one match at a time yeah. um you know. yeah and and how effective it was last week that was uh yeah a golden a golden moment which is good well it was a golden moment just we we, we made over 800 points on that market alone um just on swing trading didn't we so that was, yeah. that was very, very golden very uh, indeed yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. What about oil? Because that's taking another uh, leg down, isn't it, Jerry? So what's you know? What's yeah. Well, what's going that, on there, but can we talk I mean, that, that, about it? Yeah, we can. That, that, that's what really kicked the markets lower overnight with the Far East markets. Um, as soon as they opened up, oil just fell another. God, I don't know, another buck or whatever it is. I mean, it's no more well, than no, that. Well, no, we like closed two dollars on that. So. Yeah. That's the move down from the from the open. So we closed Friday on Brent at around sort of twenty four eighty, and now here, yeah. you know, twenty two eighty. You know, it's it's fallen yeah. another two dollars, which is yeah, that's about eight percent. Yeah, it's significant. It, it, and of course, it doesn't need to fall far now. When you're at twenty bucks, and uh, when you're up, when you're at sort of a hundred bucks, um, you need a big move for five percent. But you don't need much when you're down <laughs> to twenty bucks. And of course. It's the same deal. Um, you've got a collapse in uh, demand for oil. No one's using gasoline or petrol or diesel. Aviation fuel, I haven't seen a plane fly over my house for donkeys. Uh, so demand is falling dramatically and the outlook just looks bleak. Uh, especially it's interesting whilst... because I remember when oil was up at sort of 140 a barrel uh, and they were talking about all sorts of different ways in which they can extract oil that's a lot more expensive to try and suck more oil out of the rocks which um was more expensive to do but they could still make a profit at 140. Let's make you sort of wonder uh, which places can actually which businesses which um can actually make profit with the price as low as it is now I mean, I know Saudi yeah, have got the cheapest production costs so they're all right and they kind of triggered the whole price war in the first place but there's got to be it's got to be quite a few places you just can't produce it at this price. No, sure. No, a, a lot of the deep water rig uh, places where they extract oil, you know, from the Gulf of Mexico to uh, uh, Borneo and places like that. The, 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 there's a lot of expensive um, production areas, especially shale oil uh, as well. They reckon the production costs there are sort of north of 50 bucks a barrel. So down at $20, dollars you can only imagine what was happening. And remember, these shale oil companies that have proliferate, proliferated over the last uh, sort of eight, uh, five to eight years, uh, they are really running uh, on empty in terms of cash reserves. Uh, but of course, the, the issue with shale oil is that you're not in the middle of a North Atlantic or North Sea or in the Gulf of Mexico. You could literally just turn the switch off and stop stop doing, stop the fracking. Um, mm. So, whilst 
I, I know Saudi Arabia, the spat started with Russia, uh, but I think Saudi Arabia are looking to take market share from Russia and the US shale uh, oil business. So I can only assume, or we can only assume that shale oil production in the US, which is it's very significant now, actually makes the US the largest producer in the world now. Not not that they export much of it, uh, but without uh, with the shale oil businesses going being multiple, then uh, Saudi Arabia wants to get that uh, share of the market back again. And in Russia as well has got more expensive production. They will suffer as well on the back of this. And remember, they're very much a sort of commodity driven um, economy as well. So uh, this is not what they'd like to see. But then again, they were the architect of it partly when they refused to play ball with Saudi Arabia at the last OPEC meeting. Be careful what you wish for. There you go. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so um, anything else uh, worth referring to before we look at what's um, what's coming up for the week ahead? Uh, yeah, we can do. I mean, the the data last week was pretty shocking, uh, but I do think uh, you know we haven't really focused about China. We all thought that China was going to drag the global economy close to a recession, but of course, as the whole thing, the epicenter for this epidemic has now become Europe, uh, very much a Western. Uh, economic issue as well. Um, we've sort of forgotten about China to a certain extent, uh, but you know Chinese economic activity has uh, uh, is not going to offset the massive bumps that are happening in the rest of the uh, world's economies. Uh, and I think at the big, I think it was over the weekend China announced that industrial profits have plunged uh, by 60 billion in mm. February. That's year on year. So you know there's massive damage being done there. Uh, it really has. And and I think they're going to have to be very careful how they allow uh, people back to work, whether there'll be another spike in um, infections there as well. So we're all sort of, we're, we're behind, uh, obviously, the likes of, tai, of Taiwan, uh, South Korea, China. Uh, and we're looking at those countries and it, Italy and Spain. And we're looking to see how they've developed and what they've done to try and counteract it. And I just think we're going to be going probably the same way as Italy and Spain because they've not done anything wrong. Uh, they were slow to react, but I think we were relatively slow as well. Uh, maybe because of our borders being the English Channel, uh, maybe uh, there hasn't been such a great uh, mix uh, with the rest of Europe, if you know what I mean. But uh, I'll let the epidemiologists let us know about that rather than guess at it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably sensible. Um, yeah. Okay, so for the week coming up, we do have a bit of uh, Chinese data tomorrow, don't we, for manufacturing PMI? I'm just bringing up the calendar. Yeah. Now. yeah. Um, 44.9. So remember, 50 being the status quo. So we're expecting a you know a relative contraction uh, in manufacturing PMI. I don't know. Some of these numbers probably feel like they're sort of finger in the air, don't they? Bit bit of sort of guesswork. Yeah well finger in the air and then not, not even close half the time as well because we're so, in such uncharted territory you know with with the bulk of the population in the west really being in lockdown no one's working and if there's no you know if there's no uh, wealth creators anymore uh, businesses are being mothballed the gross domestic product will be collapsing there's you know, there's talk that the UK GDP in Q2 in the second quarter, so that's April, May, June, is going to be minus 15 percent. Yeah, extraordinary. I mean, that's, I uh, but it will recover in the third quarter and fourth quarter. Uh, but um, overall on the year, we're talking about a collapse in GDP, maybe of 5 percent, something like that. So um, significant, uh, quite significant. Anyway, so so manufacturing PMI uh, at, in, in China. Um, it's interesting because they're actually calling for a, a forecasting a bigger number than the previous month. And that's because the previous month was a complete shutdown uh, because of the spread of the um, virus. So that, that's because they were way ahead of us. Uh, I'm still not sure I'd rely on 44.9. I think it'd be worse than that. But does it matter, Aidan? You know, no, uh, it looks, it looks no. a bit confusing. Um, you know, as I said, the whole of China, I think, was on an extended holiday for three weeks in February. Do you remember when they had their new year and they extended it by couple of weeks um, and that's the reason why the data is going to be better in March yeah. but uh, I, don't I think, think it's more the, the the live sort of content. a lot of this data is historic isn't it so it's a lot of the live content that will be coming out in terms of deaths whether they're slowing down what are the what else is happening to businesses that's the thing that's really going to be driving uh, yeah yeah markets yeah. isn't it yeah um, I agree it's like non-farm payroll you know uh, we looked at this number as a fall of 81,000 um, really come on 
Um, well, Adrian, we and it's historic, about... isn't it? It's for the whole of it's for the whole yeah. of March. And I mean, it's... this is an important number, which should be, but it just in the context of what's happening with COVID nineteen infection rates, death rates, development of medical devices and stuff, they suddenly, these, those events sound more important, not non-farm payroll or ADP employment change or ISM manufacturing data or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's just not important, Adrian. It, no. it, it just isn't. Um, but anyway, so, but we talk about it because that's part of what we do. Uh, the important thing is to keep those same disciplines up, uh, but understanding that you know uh, these things are going to have little impact if other things are going on and we saw it last week uh, with the initial claims which is the you know this weekly unemployment uh, claims you see that on thursday the 2nd of april at 12 30 those un well actually i think your your clock might be a bit incorrect there you might need to just check your um Ooh, yeah. clock yeah it should be uh just match it to the, the computer clock yeah, match automatic so Anyway, so that comes out at 1.30 um, on Thursday. But those unemployment claims of, uh, well, they're not even putting in an estimate, are they? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it could just, it could be horrendous. Um, there, there, there's an article in the Financial Times, Adrian, uh, that's uh, how many more US jobs um, will be lost as coronavirus spreads is the, is the title of the article. And in it, the Financial Times says the St. Louis Fed, so this is one of the federal districts that are represented on the um, uh, Federal uh, Reserve's uh, Open Market Committee, they predict the unemployment rate could exceed 32%. 32%! It's, they're predicting at 3.8% this Friday. 32%! That's 50 million people out of work. Extraordinary. I, that might be an outlier, I hope it is. But uh, it is extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, we have to take all that with a, just not with a, a pinch of salt, but uh, um, you just never know. There's so much um, uh, that we don't know at this stage. I think um, the so, point is we'll just trade what we see on the charts, really, and let's not try and get correct. too bogged down in the economic data but, because it's going to be, which, which we, the numbers are going to be bigger than you and I can probably sort of understand, comprehend, yeah. and yeah. let's just focus <laughs> on where the turns are. Correct. It's almost better to talk about them after they've come out. But as I said, part of our job is to, to make sure make sure everyone's aware of what is coming out. I'll, I'll quickly run through them then. This this thing called the Con Conference Board Consumer Confidence in the US coming out at three o'clock on Tuesday. A regular uh, leading indicator. I've got a feeling that number, the forecast of 115, is going to be worse than what they're forecasting. Uh, we then got uh, on Wednesday at 115, that we got the private payroll company ADP that put out their own reading on non farm employment change. Uh, again, it's a stab in the dark of what they're forecasting. Uh, I'm sure ADP will be telling us. Um, and we'll find out at 1.15 uh, on Wednesday. Uh, ISM manufacturing PMI, again, these numbers, my suspicions are that they are don't represent the real fact. But that, remember in March that it, it didn't happen immediately in March uh, uh, in terms of um, the layoff and the lockdown and everything else. It's quite a, a recent phenomenon, but uh, I just think those numbers are going to be shy of it. Um, initial claims we've discussed, but and then we get on to the non-farm payroll numbers. Um, normally, you see a positive number, Adrian, so non-farm employment change as the economy has carried on doing well in the US and stock markets yeah. hit record highs. You know, you're talking about one to 200,000 jobs being created every month. Well, a minus number mean that jobs have been destroyed um, or uh, are, are going the other way. Um, the fact is 81,000, as you said to me, really? <laughs> it could I be mean, that there's going to be a lag of a month. I mean, if you think about the whole of March, I mean, maybe there were only 81. So people are still going to be paid for the month of March. Well, um, the, the so Bureau of Labor is the lag. I don't know. Well, possibly, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics is uh, calculates the number for the whole of March. And that's why... Uh, you know they publish it they can it's all done real time they can publish it pretty quickly as they do on the first friday of the following month so uh, mm -hmm. anyway the employment rate 3.8 percent. so that's the first jump for quite a while from 3.5 significant and i think you're going to see a lot more significant jumps than that in the months to, in the weeks ahead yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i think so um okay um is that um is that everything jerry do you think yeah that's that's it adrian 
um, it's okay. uh, very interesting times that times that not even I have experienced having been following the market since uh, uh, 19, 1933. Uh, 1980. <laughs> well, I've been in the market since 1980, so I've seen a, a lot of bumps, but this is probably the biggest for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, well, look, well, let's call it an end to the session there then, shall we? So, um, everybody, we'll be back again as usual. Um, for